Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Freaky Friday, and we have opened up the mailbag once again. That is Bill Landis. I am Austin Ward. And I don't... Shenanigans this week, Bill? Should we get some or no? I think we should always leave a little bit of room for shenanigans. Okay. We did structure it last week where the first half was pretty solidly football. And mm-hmm. then after that, it jumped off the rails. I don't know if that's that's probably the right mix for people. I think that's a good mix. Um, I also I think I think that's Berm's influence. I think we get into some weird stuff when Berm's around. So maybe, maybe not so much this time. You think? I don't think I know. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, maybe that's just because like you and I get into all the, the cards and WWE on the side. Like we don't need to spill it over into work and Berm just doesn't have any outlet for that. That is a fair point. Yeah. The, the c- cards and uh, watching professional wrestling are secret shames of mine that I prefer not to discuss <laughs> in public forums. It's not secret now, buddy. I spilled it. <laughs> the tea is everywhere. That's okay. We can talk about money in the bank if you want. Ah, boy. We we can do that at the end. Uh, right. I think I know where, where everybody stands. They don't probably need our thoughts on that. I bet most of the people watching this who are in that Venn diagram of the podcast and uh, money in the bank, I bet they all agree with us anyway. LA Knight yeah. should have won. That's exactly right. Uh, all right. So, if you are a member at ohiostate.rivals.com, we love you for it, and we appreciate your questions uh, for uh, this Freaky Friday edition of the Mailbag. If you are not a member there, would like to, you can use code DTE30 and join us over there right this second. Good time for it, as media days are just around the corner, and training camp will be after that. And we have a, the first one that got in. I'll give D Grins 96 credit. They were the first one to ask a question, and it was also a football one. So we spent the last two days talking about quarterbacks. Try this on for size, Bill. Who has more pairs this season, Tristan Jebbia or Lincoln Keenholz? Oh, uh, man. See, like the th- so the third and the fourth quarterback. I part of me wants to say that they both have none. Um, I think if if any of them, if either of them does register some passing yards, it would be Tristan Jebbia. Um, I do think that there's a part of Ryan Day that appreciates Tristan's willingness to enter the situation that he has entered, which is to say, like, there's no promise or, or very little prospect even of playing time when you come to be like the third guy in the room at Ohio State and be a de facto coach in the room to help along some younger quarterbacks. That's a hard player to find. Um, Ryan Day has found it at times in the past, and he's found it again with Tristan Jebbia, and I think there will be some sort of nod to Tristan doing that for Ohio State. So I I do think they'll give him an opportunity to throw the ball a little bit when those uh, chances arise in, say, like the Western Kentucky game or the Youngstown State game is probably the best opportunity. Um, And I just have a really hard time seeing Lincoln Keenholz attempt to pass. Like Devin Brown did an attempt to pass last year. I don't think Lincoln will. Not to say that Lincoln won't play. Maybe he'll get in and run the ball a little bit, but um, I think it would be Tristan, and I feel pretty strongly about that. It took a pretty extreme set of circumstances and game situations for Ohio State to get Quinn Ewers in the game, right? And there was a ton of hype and excitement over that, and it was just three handoffs. It is still very hard for a true freshman to close the gap, get on the field, and then like you only play... 12, 13, 14, 15 times a year, those reps are precious. So I can understand why there's a desire to get those younger guys out there on the field, let them taste the game. But it's still, even to just get out there and know the signals and off is a a lot more than a lot of coaches are willing to do. Uh, And you have to have like 50 point margins. The fact that it happened for Quinn Ewers against Michigan State is pretty astounding and an indictment of. that coaching staff up there, but that's that's another tangent we don't need to get into. My point is, Tristan Jebbia has already done that. He's already won games at a Power 5 level. I think that you're right. He will get an opportunity. They will tip the, the cap to someone who's willing to come in and take on the role that he did. I would also say that I thought the way he handled those reps in spring practice that we saw was pretty impressive. Um, if there was a world where Ohio State had to have a backup go in the game. 
like more resembling what Chris Chuganoff did behind mm-hmm. Justin Fields. Like Tristan Jebbia, that's as good as you could possibly hope for as a veteran transfer in the portal, in my mind. Like in an emergency situation, like that that dude could do it if pressed into it. He's not going to go ahead of Devin Brown, in my mind. Mm-hmm. But man, if if the situation got really wonky, Ohio State got a real a real blessing in the transfer portal there. I I don't know this for a fact, but I feel pretty comfortable stating it as such. I don't think any other team in the country could get down to its third quarterback and throw a guy out there who has started games in the Big Ten and the Pac-12, or have play, has played <laughs> games in the Big Ten and the Pac-12, um, and has been around as long as Tristan Jebby has. So it is a tremendous luxury for Ohio State. Myself and everyone listening to this hope it never happens. Like, uh, like we don't we don't want that. To, we don't want that to happen. I think yeah. I think you will get in the games. I, w- I was looking here. Um, so at the last, I guess the last guy they kind of had in this mold was Gunnar Hoke, right? Um, and he was like the third guy, kind of with uh, Justin Fields and, and Chris Chugging off in 2019. Um, Gunnar Hoke completed six passes for 104 yards in that season. Um, he had an attempt against Indiana, a couple against Miami, Ohio, a couple against Maryland, and one against Rutgers. Like, I think that is a body of work that Tristan Jebbia might find himself getting this year. Maybe it's more substantial than that because, um, as we said, he's, he's a pretty experienced guy and has, has had moments where he's looked pretty good. Um, like didn't they, he was, a when he was at Oregon state, they beat Oregon, right? When he was the starter, wasn't yeah, like he, a, he led, I, I remember having this conversation when he was in the portal. He, I think the, the exact situation was he let, he was starting for that game in that civil war. He had them, in position to win and then maybe broke his leg or something like as the game was ending, like late in the fourth quarter, like it was a win on his starting resume and then he didn't finish it. And that was like basically the end of his Oregon state career. I'm, I'm, I may be wrong about a few of those details, but that's the way uh, that's the story that's jogging through my brain right now. Right. Even, even like, even if that was the only game he's ever played, and that's your third quarterback. Like you can throw a guy out there who has big time rivalry game experience as your third quarterback. Um, it doesn't get much better than that. So they're they're in a good spot there. The depth in the quarterback room is really good. Um, and I don't I don't think they'll feel a need to throw Lincoln Keenholz out there just to like keep him happy or, or whatever. Um, I don't think Lincoln is is thinking along those lines right now. Um, so he might play, but I don't think he'll throw a pass. And I think Tristan will, will throw a couple. We got another. Well, we've got. M- plenty of questions about the quarterbacks we've talked about them a lot but cfl buckeye he followed up with whether we do you believe bill landis that kyle mccord is more a more talented quarterback than evan brown and will ultimately be more successful in not only college but the next level really (laughs) (laughs) sorry man hey it's it's, it's a good tough question they are members at dotting the eyes they watch the podcast. They're asking questions, and we owe it to them. Oh man, i I think I think that Devin Brown is probably more my cup of tea, like just a little more athleticism at the position. Um, but I think they're both going to be good. So, like, I guess I guess I would hedge a little bit and say, like, I don't think either one of them is going to have a bad college or pro career. I think they're both going to have good college or pro careers. If I had to pick one, and this is projecting a little bit because we've not seen a ton of Devin, it's based off of watching his high school stuff and like just kind of being around him and picking up on vibes. I think Devin is probably more of my preferred style of quarterback, so I, I might take him in the long run. Um, it's not to say that like I, I'm not saying I think he should start this year. Um, I, like I, if Kyle starts, then Kyle earned it. So. And I think Kyle will end up doing that. So I, I think Ohio State is in good hands no matter who the quarterback is over the next couple of years with those two around. Um, but maybe long term, if I had to buy stock in one over the other, I, I think I would go with Devin, but it's it's close and I'm splitting hairs. It's <laughs> the point of this quarterback conversation, I guess, is that Ohio State has a real luxury at that position that nobody else really has. Maybe Lincoln Riley has some has built something similar first at Oklahoma and now at USC. But we're talking about Tristan Jebbia like coming on the field as, as the third string option who started games and won them at the power five level. And then you're splitting hairs between five stars in Devin Brown and Kyle McCord. It it'll come down, I think, to personal preference. I think Kyle McCord is a more polished and potentially pro ready version at quarterback. That's that's how I feel about it. I think his mindset 
and enough mobility and physical tools will translate for him. And I think he's ready to lead Ohio State to the top of the Big Ten again this year. We'll see how that transpires. Both of these guys were, in a lot of ways, having to bet on potential. The one start for Kyle McCord, no real reps to speak of for Devin Brown. You know, we're throwing darts. I like I like Kyle McCord a lot. I think there's a lot to like about Devin Brown, too, and you touched on that. Right now, which one do I feel like is the safer bet? Probably just because he's more advanced, I'd say Kyle McCord. I would agree with that, and I, I think basically everything we saw in spring practice, Kyle is the more consistent passer right now, which is why I think he'll, he'll ultimately win the job. And he's got the extra year of experience in the offense. He's he's played in games, all that stuff. Like I think that will give him the leg up right now. Um, a year from now, I'll, I'll probably say similar things about Devin Brown. We'll see whether or not Kyle is still here if he goes off to the NFL after what would that I presume would be a really strong kind of debut one and done season for him. Um, but I think I think they're going to be kind of like neck and neck. And for people, this podcasting is not always a visual medium. I have my hands on uh, level <laughs> level planes here. Um, I, I think they're go- there's going to be a lot of like minor back and forth between the two. I, I think they're I think they're really close. They, they, they're going to go about it differently, but I, I think the end result is they're going to have two really good quarterbacks. Which maybe even more with Tristan Jebbia. The first time we've talked about him in months. Yeah. So shout out. To those questions. All right, we're, let's get off the quarterbacks. Not really, because <laughs> that's a spoiler for my answer. Uh, who's your buck seven? After the success of Brian Hartline and James Laurinaitis, which former player is on watch as a future Ohio State assistant? Austin, go ahead and answer that. Oh, yes, I will. Thank you. It's JT Bear. <laughs> oh, I can't I let I... you steal. I can't let you steal my answer. That was my answer, but I, there is another former Ohio State quarterback that you could pick. Who has a uh, decent tra- track record right now as a college coach? Yeah. Kenny G. Kenny G. Smooth jazz. Um, I, yeah, I would pick JT. I don't know. <clears throat> I've had this uh, thought in my head that, like, I want to go up to Detroit with a camera and a couple microphones and just, like, talk to JT about what's going on and what he sees for himself now that he's with the Lions and um, what he hopes that grows into. Cause I find it fascinating. Like I I'm sure you just as I have, like kind of always thought he'd end up in coaching just cause he, he kind of carries himself that way. He is a, he's a natural born leader. Um, and I think is probably, um, more of a tactician than he might get credit for, or you might assume, um, because he was more known for like his toughness, I guess, as a player. Um, but I think there's a, there's a mix there that's really intriguing as a coach. Um, I guess the question is always like, do you have the passion for recruiting too? And, and that's a different conversation now than it was like four years ago. So, so that's something out that's out there that you'd have to get an answer on for JT. But I think he is a rather obvious answer to this question, but I throw Kenny Guyton in there too. So I'm, I'm trying to do the quick math. So it was last February. So 16, 17 months ago, Berm and I are talking to JT a lot on the cruise. It was great to get, we did a video with him, so there was some of that, like him back in front of a camera and talking about his thoughts and his career, and then a lot of it where it wasn't, and maybe on the beach and some beverages. It was like JT has always been one of my favorite people to talk to. He had to do it so long <laughs> and in the face of so much criticism that by the end he got really worn out. And his personality and his insight in the game started to fade a little bit at least maybe the appreciation did. I don't want to put that out there for everyone, but like the way he handled things was different as he, he got as tired of it as I think many of the fans did in year four. Like it was not, it was a thankless job in some respects with a lot of scrutiny and a lot of criticism for the way he was doing it. So to be a couple years removed from that, he's tried a lot of different things professionally, some tied to football, some not. I think he was trying really hard to not just be a coach because everyone said he was going to be one. Uh, and he wasn't with the Lions yet and wasn't planning to be. I'm the other part of you putting a camera down. Like, how did you decide this was the opportunity to go do it and get started uh, and, and sneak into the background on hard knocks a few times last year? Like, <laughs> do, you, and do you like it? Because at some point, if he really wants to do it at a high level, Ohio State would be more than glad to bring him back to do it. Yeah, uh, and coach quarterbacks, and maybe be an offensive coordinator down the road. Who knows? Uh, he's he's the clear cut pick for the most likely one. And 
Kenny Guyton has more experience doing it as a recruiter, so he may be closer to making that impact for Ohio State than JT Barrett. But those are the two that that stand out at the front of the list, and it, it's really refreshing to get JT's post Ohio State thoughts now that he's not having to be in front of the cameras every single day because he's really good at it, as you said, and his insight on the game is remarkable. He had to, you know, he had to go through a lot. And there's great stories there that would be unearthed, and he could pitch Ohio State success better than just about anybody. He's, I, I hope that the appreciation for him has grown the longer he's been away, even though what Dwayne Haskins did, what Justin Fields did, what C.J. Stroud, like their appreciation for their physical work at quarterback, their statistical output is better, like just putting mm. it on paper. The career impact that J.T. Barrett made was off the charts and it never happened before yeah he is <clears throat> i guess he's not the he's not necessarily the standard for quarterback play because as you said like the position has evolved since he was here and the strengths of some of the guys they've had are, are just different than jt's but like how to lead a team how to lead a room how to lead an offense like i think he is the standard for that and not that everyone tries to copy jt because i think there's only one jt but but he is the like shining example of of how you have to connect with a team to get the most out of it, um, both on the field and off. So I think that would continue to resonate with, with like recruits. If he were ever to be in a recruiting role for Ohio state, I, I would also love the fact too, that he's right now at a place with the Detroit lions that, that seem to have a, a really good culture there with Dan Campbell and like the way that he turned that franchise around in basically a year um, was really impressive. And, and I think that that is, you know, I don't, how much does JT have to do with that? Probably, probably not much, but he's around it and he gets to absorb it. So to like have that experience coupled with his experiences at Ohio state, he's played professional football. Like there's a lot there that, that I think that Ohio state could tap into. And, and I do think that one day we'll see that happen. Yeah. I, I would be more surprised if it doesn't happen than if it does. Uh, the OSU fan would like to know, Will Indiana and the Fighting Tom Allens be able to give Day and Co. any kind of scare week one, thinking probably more when Ohio State is on offense? Um, scare might be a little too strong, um, but but maybe like I, I I think I get the spirit of the question, and I and I probably agree with it. Like they are going to try to confuse the hell out of Ohio State's offensive line that will have some new pieces and a new starting quarterback who's who's just never seen stuff like that before. Even like Kyle McCord started against Akron. Like it's good to get that game experience, but I don't, I don't know if it it prepares you all that much to play against like a Big Ten defense, even if it is just Indiana's defense. And like Macarrary is there calling the defense now. He has a, a maybe a deeper understanding of Ohio State's personnel than someone else would. I think I think that might matter a little bit too. I'm not. It's part of the reason why we talk about that spread. Like maybe you think about um, taking Indiana with a, with a four touchdown spread because of that. I still think it's a game that Ohio State ends up winning comfortably, but there could be some hiccups early because of that. It's on the road won't be a raucous environment, but it is an, an unfamiliar one for, for some of these guys. And, and that might play a part. So, um, and I think too, like I, I've, I had a conversation with uh, Zach Osterman who covers Indiana for the Indy star that people will be able to hear um, in a little, or maybe, maybe in a, in a week or so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen. Uh, it'll, it'll be, a, it'll be, it'll be a second, second conversation than all we previously had due to some, we'll call it technical difficulties, um, but it will happen here. But, uh, you know, he said that Indiana is a bit of a mystery right now with their personnel. They've got some transfers there. There's just not, there's not a whole lot to to go off of in, in terms of like um, uh, familiarity with that team. So it could get tricky. I don't, I don't know that I'd say scare, but um, I think it is a game that will tell us something about Ohio State. Like sometimes they play these openers and they kind of just sleepwalk through them and, and there's nothing really much to, to take from it. Um, I do think this will be a game we can take take some things from. Yeah, I remember we were talking about the offensive line, uh, the three of us, and it was, well, can they be ready for Notre Dame? They've got a couple of weeks to build. And I, I said, well, I'm not so sure about that because Tom Allen and Indiana have a chance to make it pretty wonky with an um, – wild blitzes they're going to go for broke they're trying to pull off an upset and we've seen this in other ohio state indiana games even when the buckeyes have won comfortably like you get a little they're going to throw something a corner blitz a safety blitz mm -hmm. double a i don't know anything and that's coming not just to kyle mccord but to you know new starting tackles for ohio state uh 
a new starting center. Like that's going to be, that's going to be a real challenge. I think um, that's probably the word more than scare. Cause I think Ohio state will adjust to it and have answers and still be able to, you know, top 30 points with out breaking too much of a sweat. Um, now they will, I think the first half can be disjointed. There may be a couple three and outs because of those blitzes there. The game seems tighter than it might be. I don't think Indiana is going to score really at all against Ohio State's yeah. defense, and that's why I think like in twenty-eight may be about right for that, but it could be you know thirty-five-seven or something along those lines, and it may be close to that number. I don't think it will be a massive blowout, and I just think that there will be opportunities where Indiana may make it uncomfortable, and as you said, provide some opportunities for growth, not just for Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, but Josh Fryer, Josh Simmons, Carson Hensman, Jacob James, whoever. Like those those five people could have a lot to learn. Yeah, I mean, these these games have gotten a little wonky on Ohio State in the past. They they opened on the road in Indiana in 2017, right? And Indiana was winning that game at halftime, I believe. Uh, Ohio State ended up winning yeah. pretty comfortably. And then uh at Minnesota two years ago, Minnesota was winning that game at halftime. And like that that was a game, I think, until like Mo Ibrahim got hurt and then Ohio State figured some stuff out and got some explosive plays. But um I think this one could feel a little similar in, in the first half because of all the reasons you said. I'm not by by no means by putting Ohio State on upset alert, but um I do think it could be interesting. More interesting than a typical opener. This one is specific for you bill okay okay i don't have any thoughts on this whatsoever (laughs) what does ohio state basketball need to do next year to have a successful season uh win more games um i i I don't know i don't i don't know that there's one thing i i think maybe I, i think my biggest thing for ohio state basketball this season is like last don't waste last year um, last year was terrible and you, you sort of signed up for it by, I think in Chris Holtman and Gene Smith's mind, dedicating yourself to playing young players. I think that is a little bit misleading. I don't think that is the only reason they struggled. It's probably not the main reason they struggled. I just think that roster chemistry was not right, um, for much of the season, but the young players, Bruce Thornton, Roddy Gale, Felix Akpara, Bryce Sensible, who's now going in, into the NBA, um, did play a lot of basketball and went through some growing pains and seemed to benefit from that at the end of the year. So if that can continue, be built upon in this off season and you go into next season with a, a couple of league guards who I, who I think have a chance to be like top 15 players in the big 10, um, a kid in Felix Akpara, who I think is a legitimate big 10 big man. Um, and then you, you hope that the chemistry of the roster that you've built around them, which has a bunch of new freshmen, a couple of transfers, you just have to hope that it, that it's better than last year. I don't, I don't know if there's like a magic bullet to just like make your chemistry better. I, I think in college basketball anymore, it's like sort of random when you're working in the transfer portal as, as much as teams are. So um, they'll have to navigate that again. But I, I think the reason that maybe you should feel confident in Ohio State basketball being better is just how well Bruce Thornton and Roddy Gale played at the end of last year. Cause I think you're going to see a lot of that this year. I completely agree with you. <laughs> I have nothing to add. Um, as we transition away from just pure football, that was a nice little segue, I guess out of all the campuses that both of us have been to covering college football or basketball, which campus was the coolest and what was the best stadium? Oh, um, see like best stadium's tricky because like best stadium for our purposes is certainly not Beaver stadium, but best, <laughs> best stadium to like sit in an atmosphere and watch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then, then I think the answer is Beaver stadium. If you're there for, for a night game and you're all sauced up, um, that's, that's a good time. Um, I like Oklahoma a lot. Um, we have not, at least in my time covering the beat, there have not been a, a lot of, like out of the ordinary road games. Like we ended up not going to Oregon. The TCU game ended up becoming a one-off. Um, Oklahoma, unless I'm forgetting something, um, I think might be the only out-of-conference road game I've covered. So so that was cool. Um, oh, no, at Virginia Tech too, but Virginia Tech stunk that year, and it was not 
Blacksburg, I don't think what it is not what it was in its heyday. So um, the campus was nice though. It was brutally hot. I was I have never sweat more walking from my car to the to the press box than I did on that day when they played at Virginia Tech, which was pretty unbearable. Um, so I might say like uh, coolest stadium is probably Beaver Stadium. Coolest campus, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, like Indiana's campus is really nice and like the town is cool. I, I've not really gotten to experience it for a football weekend because. Ohio State fans take over the town. It's impossible to get a hotel, but I've gone there for basketball games. I've gotten to experience Bloomington on a more intimate level, uh, and I really enjoyed myself. <laughs> Where at? Uh, we went to a steakhouse there. I can't remember what it was called. Um, I was with Kevin Noon and Steve Hellwagon. It was a very you don't lovely say. time. Yeah, it was a lovely time. They you, found you a wanna- steakhouse? You want to find a place to have a steak and a drink on the road? Uh, those guys, th- th- that's who you, you, you follow. Um, and then we went to a bourbon bar after that. Um, and it was a nice time. I enjoyed myself. Question is a, is a trickier, harder one for me because I've covered three different leagues. Um, starting in the Mountain West where a lot of the coolest campuses, that's where they're going to check in. Some of the smaller ones, the less known ones, I guess. Um, and then I would transition there to the SEC. So you know what some of those elite stadiums and campuses are like before coming to the Big Ten. So I've experienced a lot of them now that I've cl- getting closing in on 20 years doing this. Uh, I have a hard time answering it, except that I say all the time that some of the best destinations to go cover college football are in the Mountain West. And that was Hawaii wasn't even in the league then, so I didn't have to do that one. Um, <laughs> but going you know, multiple times a year to cover games in Las Vegas is pretty, pretty sweet. Um, that stadium is a dump. Uh, I believe they're trying to upgrade that finally. Um, but you know, going to places like New Mexico and, and Albuquerque is awesome. I hate Colorado state, but Fort Collins is one of the great college towns around, um, uh, an awesome stadium, Utah at rice Eccles, You're right there. They, they really upgraded it for the winter Olympics. Uh, whenever that was 23 years or 21 years ago. So the press box is immaculate. And then you look out and you're the mountain range, you've got the stadium below you and the mountain range up uh, ahead. It's incredible. And you go to the back of the press box, you look at downtown Salt Lake. That is an, a really cool stadium. Of course, that's not in the mountain West anymore. That's a, a PAC 12 destination. Uh, I got tired of covering games at Neyland stadium. Um, and I also, Spent two years on that campus before that, so um, it kind of got worn out. But Tennessee is one of the great venues for college football. Uh, I say a lot that they're that campus, and then having a hundred thousand seats, there are not a lot of places like Columbus. But Knoxville does a a reasonable job, uh, a reasonable facsimile of it, I guess. And having a home and home between those two schools would be pretty neat, I think. Yeah. Um, some of the others that you talk like I don't I didn't really enjoy Tuscaloosa or Bryant Denny like I don't there's nothing to it for me I didn't like it um, going down to Georgia their campus is pretty awesome but there's nothing special about Sanford Stadium I, I don't need to go through all of that list I suppose but I really a lot of those smaller ones I enjoyed getting to go to like the campus at Oxford for Ole Miss Oxford Mississippi um, yeah. In the Big Ten, like I really hate um, Beaver Stadium with a passion. <laughs> so even for te- even if people ask, like I really want to go there and I want to experience a whiteout, I usually say, "Don't do it. Don't do it." If you can, if you can teleport there, then it's great. But if you have to actually drive yourself there, find a place to stay, find a place to park, uh, deal with the traffic as you're leaving, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that uh, makes it a less desirable place to travel to for sure. Um, yeah. I think, what do you think uh, is the worst? The worst stadium? Uh, Sorry, I, was, um, I interrupted. I interrupted whatever you were going to say after Penn State. Well, I was going to say that I have. This is not for work purposes, but um, just because I like going to college campuses when we travel places. Like I've been to Colorado State Stadium, I've been to Wyoming Stadium, I've been to <laughs> New Mexico Stadium, um, and those campuses. Uh, they're all very cool. Like I loved Wyoming, and that's not just me pandering to you. I thought I thought Wyoming was very cool. Um, I didn't want to say like. I like places that like open up their stadiums when there's nothing going on. You can just like walk in and check it out. There are some places I've had to break into broken the Jordan hair down in Auburn. That was fun. Um, but like Wyoming, you can just kind of walk in and that was really cool. Um, and I also on that same trip, we were 
out west. Uh, we went to Golden, Colorado, where the Colorado School of Mines is. Um, and that is a, I don't I think they're D3 maybe or D2. Um, that was a cool stadium. It's like kind of like built into a side of a mountain and like landscapes are, are really nice. And, uh, you know, there's good beer around there. So um, Colorado in general, I think, is, is a very underrated place to go to imbibe uh, on some beers and take in some college football. <laughs> Well, you made a great point. Laramie is a fantastic place for college <laughs> and college football. Uh, I think there should be a home and home of that as well. Um, Love it. What was this? Oh, yeah. What embarrassing story can you share about Berm that he can't be there to defend? I love this question because <laughs> all the embarrassing stories about Berm in our, what are we, we're six or seven years into working together. I, like we talk about it publicly. I don't think Berm is actually embarrassed about anything, which is a great yeah. trait to have. But when he does, when it does happen to him, he's the first one to tell that story. He is the first one to tell that story. I, I appreciate um, his appreciation, I guess, for self deprecation. Um, I don't know if this is embarrassing, but like the, the, the allusion we made to my conversation with Zach Osterman, Berm deleted the podcast <laughs> before we got to run it. So uh, we have to record that again, I guess. Um, that was a, uh, that was a, f- uh, it was in the moment it was like, it was frustrating, but then I, I grew quickly to appreciate the humor um, in, in a podcast is getting deleted. So um, I don't know if that's embarrassing for him, but I did find that quite funny. Um, I don't know. Yeah, he usually wears that on his sleeves, I think. I don't think he's a guy who who shies away from the from the weird things that he does. Yeah, because of that, and because he's not here, I was going to approach that answer in a different way, which is that he's not embarrassed by anything. But since he's not here, I can say the reason that I like working with him so much is that I don't think there's anybody better in the country at covering recruiting than Berm. And getting to see his work ethic and desire to do it on a day in day out basis at the level that he does and the skill that he does is amazing. I think everybody who follows this podcast and has followed our work wherever we've been before already knows that, but I would be remiss if I didn't once in a while, it's really freaking impressive to see him do what he does and he can't, you know, he has to just take it right now. Yeah. That'll be what really drives him crazy is the praise for it. Cause he, that's not why he does it, but um, he's the man, he's the best in the business. And, you know, I, I couldn't really, the way that sports media works anymore, you've got to have somebody who can cover recruiting and that really important part of it. Like there's no way that uh, our podcast or dotting the eyes or Ohio state that rivals.com would be, uh, as successful without him putting that on his shoulders. So suck it, Berm. You <laughs> are too good at your job, and I appreciate it. Yeah, he's the best. Um, which I like I thought for a long time watching him from afar, but now that I've gotten to work with him over the last year, I have even more of an appreciation for that. And like as you said, like t- in today's sort of journalism world, like there I don't think there are a lot of people who can like be on top of news, turn around a story shoot photos the way that Berm does. Like he's an excellent photographer. Um, and then do like the graphic design stuff and the production stuff for the podcast that he does. So he is, he's a machine. He's too much of one. That's my biggest headache is I have to tell him to stop working. Like he yeah, wants to do true. so <laughs> wants to do so much. He should be embarrassed by how much he wants to work. That's what <laughs> that's, a should, good, that's a good point. He won't, he won't admit to that. I'm like, even this week, you were joking about him deleting this podcast, but he was uh, the the Tom or the Zach Osterman podcast. But he was gonna. He's been editing all the podcasts this week, even while he's supposed to be on vacation. And he's you know worried about if there's a, a commitment that happens, or uh, does he have enough prepared so that you and I could fill in if need be? Which like we've been doing this a long time. We can we can help, bud. Yeah, like I don't know if you just tell me who the person is. I know the other pieces about what how they fit for the Ohio State roster. I can help you out. Um, but yeah, that's the part where in our relationship, I got used to at ESPN, they're saying you have to take three months off like because you work every single day from August until January and we need you to like cool it in the summer. And 
many of you have probably noticed that at ohiostate.rivals.com that I am more than willing to take that time off and not write for a week. Maybe you don't, maybe, maybe that annoys you, but I got to do it for me. And he won't. Burn will not stop writing, will not stop working, will not take vacations. And he, I him to do that, but he just cares too much. Maybe, he does care too much. He, oh, he lives to work, that guy. I don't mean it to sound, sound like I don't care about my job because I really do. Um, but if you tell me that there's nothing to write about for a week, then I'm just not going to write. I'm not going to fake it because I had to do that for a really long time. Somebody else asked what our least favorite part of th this job was. And that used to be it for me, like counting down 50 players that are going to impact Ohio State and just writing about the whole roster for 300 words was the worst part of the job. And <laughs> I don't think that people like reading it. Like they, the people, uh, the Ohio State fan base already knows who's on this roster and who's going to play and who's going to start. So, I thought that was the worst part, and I just axed that part when I got the ability to do so. Yeah, you have to you have to find ways to fill it up a little bit in the off season, but you want it to be meaningful. That's always a delicate balance. Um, like I tried to do that with the state of the position series, but. Um, yeah, writing just like what is what amounts to like a list of players is <laughs> not is not super compelling content, I think, to write or to consume. So we try to avoid that. Yeah. All right. That's um there's more questions in here and we appreciate it greatly. Maybe we'll have another mailbag next week. Maybe we'll just answer those on uh the horseshoe lounge at ohiostate.rivals.com. Uh we'll see. We've got a little more off season to go before we really ramp up the coverage, we're obviously excited to do so. I've said that every day this week, and I will again next week. Uh, we'll be back with uh, full coverage on the podcast daily as normal. Expecting to have a few more guests on the show as we get closer. Stay tuned for that. I uh, hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and thanks for joining us on the podcast daily Freaky Friday Mailbag. For Bill, I am Austin. We will talk to you later.